sometimes on Sunday nights when you're getting ready for bed and you know you got to go through this big long work week again you just got this crummy feeling and it's like you've ran out of stuff to look forward to sometimes there's all kinds of stuff that we look forward to in this life for example if I got me a new Bible coming in the mail I'm so excited and I can't wait for that new Bible to get there. And all week I'm looking at the front doorstep to see if that package is there waiting for me. Or maybe you got a vacation coming. And you're waiting for months and months for that vacation to come. So you don't have to get up early in the morning. And you can sleep in a little bit. And you can go spend some time with your family. And you look forward to that. Well, there's all kinds of things in the Bible to look forward to. And these things are lasting things, not these temporal things down here that we look forward to. Now, sometimes you get, it's like you believe the things are real. You'll say that they're going to happen. But then it's almost like you really don't believe they're going to be going to happen. Or else you would look more forward to it than you actually do. So I'm just going to remind you of some things that are going to happen and give you something that you can look forward to on a Monday. It's Monday and you got if you're like me you got a long work week ahead. But there's something to look forward to. Number 1, the catching away. I don't know if you know what the catching away is. Which one of my favorite subjects in the Bible is the rapture of the church. Sometimes at work, it's like seven, seven, 7 in the morning, and I'm just wishing that the rapture would just happen right then so I don't have to finish the day out. And it might sound scary to you, the rapture, but every single problem you have right now would be over if the rapture happened right now. Every single problem. Because the catching away is a comfort. It's a comfort. And you should comfort each other with these words. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You see that? We're not like lost people that have no hope. We're not like an atheist that has no hope. When an atheist a loved one dies, there's no hope of seeing them again. They don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe there's a God, supposedly. So th- that was it. When their loved one took their last break, breath to them, that was it. They'll never see them again. They have no hope. When a lost person takes his last breath, or their loved one takes their last breath, they have no hope of seeing them again. Unless they're just deceived into thinking that everybody goes to heaven when they die. They literally have no hope of seeing their loved one again. But but Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of this, brethren. Concerning them which are asleep. Now, asleep don't mean they're taking a nap. Asleep is the ones that are dead. The ones that are already gone that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're dead right now. He don't want you ignorant concerning them. And don't sorrow for them like those lost people, like those atheists that have no hope, because you're going to see them again. Look at verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, you don't have to sorrow as those which have no hope because those loved ones of yours that have already gone on to be with the Lord, He's bringing them with Him. He's bringing their soul with Him. Their body's in the grave, but their soul has been with the Lord Jesus Christ. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those that are dead in Jesus, will God bring with Him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain 
unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep or alive and remain. That would be us. If the rapture happened right now, you would be a part of that of those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You're prevent. I used to think that meant we're not going to stop those who are asleep. But the prevent word there means pre-event, meaning you're not going to rise up before those who are asleep. You're not going to pre-event them. You're not going to prevent them which are asleep. Those that are dead in Christ are those that are asleep. It says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, that would be Michael, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You see, those that are asleep are the dead in Christ, and they're going to rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, the catching away is a comfort. It's something to look forward to. And every problem you have would be solved if the rapture happened right now. So, comfort each other with these words. Corruptible bodies are going to be changed. With the catching away, you can comfort one another with these words, and these corruptible bodies are going to be changed. These, these, um, these mortal bodies are going to be made immortal. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, this, this verse is why you hear people say that at the rapture, you're going to have a lot of blood left behind. There's going to be piles of blood and clothes left behind because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. You see, the rapture is a mystery. One of the seven mysteries that the uh, Apostle Paul speaks about, he says, We shall not all sleep, talking about be dead, not talking about taking a nap. He's talking about we should not all sleep. We will not be dead, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, faster than the blink of an eye. A twinkling of an eye is even faster than the blink of an eye. At the last trump, not at the seventh trumpet, at the last trump. The trump is the sound made by a trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Those dead bodies of the saints are going to come up out of the graves or out of the vases where they're cremated or wherever their body's buried somewhere, even if it's scattered across all 50 states. God can bring it back and change it. It says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's the bodies of the dead saints that are corrupted, that have seen corruption. They're going to put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. That would be those who are alive and remain. Me and you, this immortal, this mortal we put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You see, I've got this body that can be corrupted, that will see corruption. I, I'm going to put on incorruption. i got this mortal body. I'm going to put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dearly beloved, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why work for the Lord after you get saved if you're saved by grace through faith? Because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, people always say that. Well, you just think you can get saved and live however you want to. No, one of the reasons you 
live right after you get saved and work after you get saved is because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's going to mean something. You're going to be glad that you did at the rapture. You can look forward to the rapture because you're getting a new body, this vile body. Philippians 3.21 Our vile body is going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You should comfort one another with these words. These corruptible bodies will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You don't like your body now, you're really going to like it then. You're going to like it when you get a new one. All that sickness is going away. Any trouble you're having in this body, it's going away. So you can look forward to the catching away, the rapture of the church. Now number two, another thing to look forward to, the crowning moment, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, not all saints can look forward to this one. If they're not living for the Lord, if they haven't suffered for the Lord. And I, I don't I don't I'll be honest, I don't think I'm even looking forward to it because I don't even know that I'm I don't know that I'm doing good enough to get a crown. You know, salvation is easy, but serving God is hard. Salvation is free. Serving God costs you something. But if you're suffering for Jesus Christ and you're trying to live for God, doing the best you can with the right motive, you can look forward to this crowning moment at the judgment seat of Christ. You can count on being judged by Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 14, 10 through 12. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't worry about judging all your brothers. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us is going to give account for what we are doing with the Lord Jesus Christ after we got saved. That's another reason to live for God, even though you're saved by grace through faith. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord, and you're going to give account of yourself to God. Notice, I'm not giving account of everybody else. I'm giving account of myself to God. It matters how you live. Can you say that you're looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ? Can you say you're looking forward to the rapture? Or have you been saved? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? In 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, Paul mentions it again. Wherefore we labor... He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Wherefore we labor, and remember, your labor is not in vain in the Lord, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him, not in regards to salvation, but in regards to your Christian service. Is it acceptable? Are, are you presenting your bodies a living, sac a living sacrifice? Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Are the things that you're doing in this body while you're waiting on the catching away, waiting on the rapture? Are they good and acceptable? Or are they bad? Now turn to 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 17. More on the judgment seat of Christ. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. See, the moment you got saved, you laid a foundation. God laid a foundation for you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you're spending the rest of your life building on that building on that foundation and then you're going to present this building to the Lord Jesus Christ 
at the judgment seat of Christ. It says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, that's what you want to be building with. Is gold, silver, precious stones. How do you do that? Well, you live for the Lord and you do it with the right motive. You work for God and you do it for Him. And that's how you're building with precious stones and gold and silver. He says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. You don't want to be building with wood, hay, and stubble because it's not going to make it. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You see, you're going to present your building to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to put it through the fire. It's going to be revealed by fire, and the fire is going to show what your building is made of. What sort is it? What was the motive? If any man's work abide, which he, which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. If he puts it through the fire and it's gold, silver, precious stones, it's going to make it out on the other side, and then you're going to get it back. You're going to get a reward for it. But then it says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. You ain't going to get nothing back for it. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That right there shows you there's Christians that are living for their self, not doing anything for God, or they're doing everything that they did for God was really for them, and they're not going to have nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. So you can't always judge a person's salvation. You can't judge a person's salvation by how they're living. They could be saved and just living for their self, and then they're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ, and their building's going to go through the fire, and they're just going to get nothing back. But if you're living for God, you've been suffering for God, doing things with the right motive, you can look forward to the crowning moment. The Bible talks about crowns that are going to be given out. And you can cast your crowns at His feet. At the crowning moment, you can count on being judged by the Lord Jesus Christ and you can cast your crowns at His feet. Revelation 4, 10 through 11 talks about it, how they cast their crowns before the throne. You don't want to get up there and not have anything to cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the third thing to look forward to is the coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. The catching away, the crowning moment, the coming King. Now, the, this, this coming isn't the same as the rapture. At the rapture, He comes back to get me. At the second coming, He comes back with me. He's at this, uh, the coming King is coming with all the saints. Revelation 19, 11 through 16, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The Lord is a man of war, and he's coming to make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. No wonder he just had a bunch of saints throw their crowns at his feet. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. There's the saints, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You see that? That's the saints. That's us coming back with the Lord. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Are you so discouraged with how evil this world is? Are you so discouraged with the wickedness going on? And how there's people just killing innocent people? How the people's just doing each other wrong? And all these God-haters around everywhere? All that's going to be over when Jesus Christ comes out of the clouds to set up his kingdom. All them God-haters is going away. There's still going to be some people that secretly go against the Lord, but he's going to rule them with a rod of iron, it says. In verse 15 there, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They're not going to be able to act out on their wickedness anymore because he's, he's ruling with a rod of iron. They're going to do it 
underground in the and during the millennial reign but it's not going to be like it is now it's going to be a, a righteous rule he's ruling them with a rod of iron and all this wicked stuff you see in the in the government now and his government it's not going to be that way you can look forward to it they're not going to there's not going to be no assassination of him if they tried to assassinate him, the bullet's just going to bounce right off of him. The sword's just going to be bent in two. You can look forward to that. You can look forward to the coming king coming with the saints and you behind him on a white horse, and he's coming in vengeance. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire. That's how he's coming. And why is he coming? He's coming to get rid of the God-haters and set up his kingdom on this earth. He's going to kick the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. He's going to bound the devil for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. Read that in Revelation 20. And you're going to see the captain reigning. This is the fourth, the fourth thing to look forward to. Look forward to the captain reigning, the coming king and then the captain reigning. He is the captain of our salvation. He's the captain of the Lord of hosts in Joshua chapter 5. And he's coming and he's chaining up the devil. In Revelation 20 and verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So he's going to chain the devil up. The unclean spirits, he's going to cause them to pass out of the land. And it's going to be the greatest time the world's ever seen because you're going to have a perfect ruler reigning with a rod of iron. You're going to have the captain of your salvation reigning. There's not going to be no wickedness. There's not going to be no pride parades. There's not going to be no sex trafficking going on. You're going to have him ruling with a rod of iron and millions and millions of his uh, sons of God ruling over cities that can walk through solid objects that can appear and disappear at will that can teleport that can do all these things because we're going to be in glorified bodies we're going to be cleaning up the world the devil's going to be chained up the lord's going to be cleaning up the world he's going to rule it with a rod of iron revelation uh, 19 15 the child shall die a hundred years, Isaiah 65, 20, meaning a hundred-year-old is going to be like a child. The animals are going to go back to like they were before the flood, where uh, you can have a wolf for a pet, a lion for a pet. It says in Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, they shall not hurt nor destroy, and all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You're going to have somebody to talk Bible with. The whole earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Everybody's going to know about him. You're not going to have to go and say, know the Lord. You're not going to have to have them get to know the Lord. You're not going to have to go witness to him. They're all going to know him from the least to the greatest. And Luke 1, 32 through 33, it says, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So you got the captain reigning, and after that, you know what happens at the end of the millennium? The devil is loose a little season. He gets an army together, 
as the sand of the sea, but a fire just comes down out of heaven and devours them. But then it's not the rain's not over. The Lord Jesus Christ, just because a thousand years up doesn't mean the rain's over. You got a continuing city. That's the next thing you can look forward to is the continuing city. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're citizens of a holy nation, according to Peter. And Galatians 4.26 says, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. New, Jerusalem's, New Jerusalem is going to come down out of heaven from above, and it's going to uh, go around the earth, and that's going to be the home of the church for all eternity. And you can look forward to this continuing city. There's going to be no crying, sorrow, or death. All that comes to an end. And Revelation 21 verse 2 it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. See, this is a good city. Most cities are bad. They've been bad since Cain made one back there in Genesis. But this is a city from God. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. That's something you can look forward to. Eternity is going to be even greater than the millennium. There's going to be no more death, no secret sin, no underground uh, get-together of people against the Lord. It's going to be a continuing city with no sin. So some things to look forward to, the catching away, the crowning moment, the coming king, the continuing city.